Ladies and gentlemen, if you could take a seat. Uh, we're about to commence um, yet another uh, well-attended and well-programmed uh, breakfast briefing on uh, Michael Green's list, uh, list B. Um, today, of course, it's in the field, the substantive law field of wills and estates, or as some call, uh, call it wills and probate. Um, we've got two particularly well qualified, in a very rounded sense, but particularly in that field, two very well qualified speakers uh, who are uh, leading juniors on our list in the area. The first is Terry Constantinou, and the second is Eleanor Coates, uh, both of whom have both at the bar and in their practice life prior to the bar have had uh, considerable experience with the uh, uh, with the issues that arise uh, in the field of wills and uh, estates. Uh, can I say that the, the, the program format is the same as usual. There'll be a half an hour uh, from each speaker uh, who will speak to their papers rather than read their papers, of course. I've read their papers and they're extremely good. Um, the topics are, are interesting, they're novel, and they provide insights which will be relevant to all of you and probably in a context which has uh, maybe perhaps not has arisen in the course of your practice, but may well do so uh, uh, in the future. Um, Terry Con Constantin, who was uh, admitted to practice in 1997 and signed the bar roll in 2002. So she's been at the bar for 10 years and prior to that was admitted to practice and uh, practiced both in state and uh, federal jurisdictions for five years prior to signing the role. She has expertise in um, wills and, and in the actual litigation relating to probate and states, in particular part four claims under, under the Act. And of course I noticed that the year she was admitted to practice was the year in which the Act was irrevocably amended by the, the then Liberal Attorney General Jan Wade to include claims under Part 4 for, uh, for just about everyone, including probably the family dog. Um, <laughs> Terry's the author of a recent article published in the Wills and Probate Bulletin, of which I'm on the editorial committee, uh, entitled Pitfalls in Your Wills and Estates Practice and How to Avoid Them. It sounds like a pretty good place to start. She also, however, has experience in... Uh, corporate insolvency, bankruptcy and property law, which is of course uh, fundamentally aligned to this field of uh, wills and probate because almost every estate at the very least involves a family property. She also has been involved in recent litigation uh, as a member of our list in intellectual property rights, uh, licensing in manufacturing fields and a joint venture dispute concerning service departments. So she has a, a broad practice. Um, she recently appeared as junior counsel in the Court of Appeal on uh, an issue concerning fraud on the trustees' powers in uh, a, a case called Accurate Financial Consultants against Coco Black Proprietary, which I notice has been cited in a number of cases uh, since. That was in 2008 in the full court, or in, uh, now the Court of Appeal, and that has been cited. Mo most importantly, well, that, not most importantly, but significantly, uh, Terry, as with, um, as with Eleanor, uh, has extensive qualifications and training in the field of mediation, which is, of course, nowadays relevant to all of you. Uh, she has gained her accreditation in the LEADR Mediation Group in 2004, and in June of this year, only two months ago, gained accreditation as a nationally recognised mediator under the NMAS Mediation Scheme. Her paper, uh, under the heading... Uh, of, indeed it's the heading for the, for the uh, breakfast, what's in the brief, recent case in wills and probate. She has three, uh, I noticed three, uh, I consider novel and important topics. The first is the issue of summary judgment uh, in originating, summary judgment generally, but particularly in originating proceedings. Uh, and that's a matter close to my heart because I think I was in the first case Harris against Bennett in 2002 in the, uh, uh, before Justice MacDonald, 2008 VR 411, where 
um, it, it was it was first enunciated, certainly at a reported level, that uh, summary judgment under Rule 23 can be instituted not just in proceedings commenced by writ, but also proceedings commenced by originating motion. And as you've probably have experienced since then, it is done not infrequently, and I think properly, in the first return of directions before the uh, before the associate judge, where a case is so weak uh, and without uh, real merit that a defendant is entitled, in my view, and ought to, as a matter of uh, duty to the client, uh, issue a summons to have the proceeding put to sleep, as it were, uh, under Rule 23. So that, that is the first topic of, uh, of Terry. The second is an issue, again, in which I appeared in the most recent case, the issue of freezing orders, uh, and Terry will take you through that, that is to, particularly in this area of litigation, and also more generally in trusts, which is the case I was in just uh, two months ago in front of His Honour uh, Justice Kavanagh and then His Honour Justice Hargrave, uh, freezing the estate. When, when, you, when the evidence arises that the estate's being dissipated uh, before the matter comes to trial, again, there's a duty, in my view, to take such action uh, under the rules as one can, and there, there's plenty of uh, body for that in the, in the rules, uh, for freezing orders to prevent the wastage of the estate. And the final and, and, and a hoary old chestnut, but it, it, it's important to update you on it, is the field of costs. And, uh, and uh, Terry uh, has written uh, an informative uh, section of her paper on that field uh, uh, in the area. So I, I ask you to thank uh, or to uh, introduce uh, Terry Alatiriu to present her paper. Thank you. Good morning. And that's a very good effort to pronounce my first name there, Eleftheria. So uh, thank you for, for that. All the Greeks in the room will be um, uh, will find that name um, quite um, um, uh, common. So so I'm going to start with summary judgment. And thanks, Tony, for that um, useful uh, summary. Um, I think. Since the Court of Appeal clarified the test, uh, I think that we're going to have quite an influx of summary judgment applications being made, and as Tony mentioned, quite rightly so. Um, I'm sure you've all had uh, the situation where you've seen a claim come across your desk, and it just doesn't smell right, does it? I mean, it, it's for want of a better word, or want of a better description, it just is a try-on. And um, it's, it's time that we start putting those claims, as Tony mentioned, uh, to rest. They are a waste of time, a waste of the court's time, and a waste of money. Um, they dissipate estates considerably. So it's about time that um, we started to be a bit more aggressive and realistic about prospects of success, um, a bit more confident in the way that we advise our clients. Um, I've often been briefed to uh, advise on prospects of success and uh, recently I've, I've said to three of my instructors don't even bother this is not going to get across the line it is a try on it's time that you advise the client now rather than going to trial and having a judgment delivered that is scathing of um, uh, why the claim was brought in the first place and then having to explain to your client um, what the judge has said and why. I mean, it's really up to us to filter out all the rubbish and just get to the main, um, the main cases that are, that are really worth running and do raise interesting questions um, and issues for determination. Um, Eleanor will talk about some really good um, recent part four claims that have been made um, um, by girlfriends, for example, and cousins. And, um, you know, it's important that... Um, we understand prospects of success and how we can get good results, not just good results, but great results for our clients. It's not, not about just going to trial and winging it. It's about enforcing rights where they are um, appropriately to be enforced. Um, and that leads me to my next point, that really, um, apart for claims in particular, I think we all have a duty to treat them as commercial cases. I mean, they are commercial cases. We're dealing with money. In most cases, we're dealing with multi-million multi dollar estates. And um, it's important that we 
develop strategies in running these cases commercially and again, not just to get a, a good result but a great result, not just to tick the boxes under section 91 subsection 4, not just go through the motions. Think about what goes in your affidavit material. Think very carefully about it. Um, as I'll discuss the case of Dardanus and Zerkus in relation to a discovery application, that could have been a very uh, different case and run uh, quite differently had there been a little bit more thought put into um, the affidavit material and, and a little bit more thought into what exactly the plaintiffs were seeking to achieve in that case. Um, so Lysort Building Solutions, now that wasn't a Wills case, <laughs> but um, nevertheless it's an, it's an important decision because it does clarify the test for summary judgment. Um, so uh, the, the old test, if you like, was um, really determining whether a case was hopeless, bound to fail, is there a serious question to be tried? And the Victorian Law Reform Commission, when it was asked to, to consider this um, aspect, uh, agreed that that test was overly stringent. I mean, let's face it, it's not hard to prove that a case is not hopeless or bound to fail. Any skerrick of evidence to suggest otherwise would get you over the line. It was very easy to get over that line. Um, and so what the uh, new test in Section 63 of the Civil Procedure Act um, if that is relevant for you, um, then, uh, and, and I suggest that most, most will be mostly relevant because uh, originating motion claims uh, will be commenced. That will be the section that will be relevant for you to consider in terms of summary dismissal. Um, the, I've set out the section in my paper, I won't read it, but the key words in that section are real prospects of success. Real prospects of success. And um, poor Justice Vickery in the uh, uh, decision at first instance in Lysort, he threw his hands up in the air in frustration because in his course of his uh, reasoning and judgment, um, he discovered that there was a plethora of cases. If you look in civil procedure, Williams, under the commentary for section 63, I think you'll find four or five pages of cases that are cited. Um, recently, going back from 2010, right through to some of the English authorities. They're just jumping all over the place. Um, to be fair on Justice Vickery, he didn't hear full argument from the parties at first instance on what the test should be. Um, and when he discovered the huge uh, range of cases, he decided, look, it's all too hard. I'm going to refer it off to the Court of Appeal. We need to determine finally what real prospects of success means. And that's what the Court of Appeal did um, constituted by Chief Justice Warren, Justices Nettle and Neve. And they uh, held, ultimately, that real meant not fanciful. So that's what we're looking at. The court is required to determine, practically speaking, on the evidence before it, are there real prospects of success, not just fanciful prospects? Is this a try-on or is this does this claim have legs? Now that is, as you can well imagine, a much less stringent and um, more liberal test. And I would suggest that with the uh, high increase in part four claims uh, recently, I think that will be tempered with um, summary judgment claims being issued now. Now that the test has been clarified, I think we're gonna have a lot of those coming through, particularly in will caveat cases as well, it must be emphasized. Um, in will caveat cases, the executor has a prima facie obligation to show that the will was uh, valid. And then once that prima facie onus is discharged, that onus then shifts to the caveator. And um, I would suggest that uh, the caveator, once the prima facie case, the will is, is, uh, is valid, um, unless there are very sufficient grounds, real prospects of success grounds to uphold the caveat, um, then it's likely that that uh, will be dismissed. So I can see with the clarification of the test being um, uh, being settled now, I can see quite a few increases in those cases. And you might want to even consider them for your own. If you've got current will caveat cases and part four claims, now's the time to consider whether if you're acting for an estate, do you take the, um, take the step now to uh, summarily dismiss 
and it's on the evidence before the court as it is presently framed. So have a look at your affidavit material. If you think that it's a try-on, go for it. Um, I suggest that the Associate Justices are very open to considering those claims. Um, it's, uh, it's probably important to... If you, Justice Dixon in Auditon Investments actually set out some of the principles there. Um, I've set them out at page three of the paper and he basically summarises what I've just stated. Um, it's very b briefly, he says that um, in determining the test for summary judgment under section 63, the court will have regard to the following principles. If a claim or defence was hopeless, untenable, bound to fail or could not possibly succeed, then it ought to be summarily dismissed. And what is required is a practical assessment, a practical assessment by the court as to whether a claim has more than a fanciful prospect of success. There's those key words again. So real means more than fanciful. Um, the court's discretion is very wide. Um, the court may be satisfied that there is no real prospects of success, however, consider the dispute to be of such a nature that only a full hearing on the merits is appropriate. And that brings me to section 64. Um, again, I've extracted that section in the paper. But just because a case is not hopeless or bound to fail, it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't um, have uh, real prospects of success either. So um, it still leaves it open and Chief Justice Warren in Lysort uh, agreed that the Section 63 did leave it open for a court to decide that um, even if a case is not hopeless or bound to fail, it may still not have real prospects of success. So again, a more liberal test and one that I think will be um, looked at very closely by the courts. So have a look at that case. It's, it's, it's not a very long case. It's, it's very... Um, succinct and sets out the principles clearly. So I'll just uh, jump to the next case, Discovery. Um, Dinarchus and Zerkus and Zerkus. This was um, an application under part four of the, uh, of the Act by the two plaintiff daughters of the deceased. The executors were the son and the grandsons of the deceased. Um, and uh, the will left the daughters approximately 950000 each and the executor beneficiaries got $4.7 million respectively. So quite a bit of discrepancy there. Um, now, during the course of the Part 4 claim, the plaintiffs sought um, various documents. The deceased was uh, a Greek man of the generation of my parents that came to Australia with one suitcase and made a very good life for themselves. They worked hard and developed quite a wealthy, um, in this case, he developed quite a wealthy empire. And um, I think he had uh, fruit and vegetable uh, stores and eventually cool stores. Um, with the money that he made from that, he invested um, heavily into property so he had quite a, a complex, um, if you like, family trust structures involved, corporate entities, um, shares, all, all the rest of it. Uh, and what he did, or what the plaintiffs um, alluded to in their affidavit material, and I'll come to that in a minute, but what they alluded to was the fact that um, Dad gave made many inter vivos gifts and transfers to the son and the grandsons um, during his lifetime. And the, the daughters complained that this, the, the boys of the family, if you like, they had the benefit of dad's wealth during his lifetime and they didn't. And so they've now missed out on that benefit after his death. There was a clear discrepancy and that, that should be fixed. That was what they were basically arguing. So they sought... Um, 16 categories of documents. It was quite a complex discovery application. The 16 category, categories of documents involved um, family trust documents, access to financial records, um, income tax returns of the trust, um, details of every transaction that occurred between the boys and the dad. There were property transfers, share transfers, you name it, it was all done. Uh, and so they wanted access to those documents and also all of the negotiations access to documents concerning the negotiations and acquisitions of the various properties and assets. Um, now, 
we all know that uh, discovery in proceedings commenced by originating motion uh, is not ordered as of right. You need to show that there are special circumstances. And, but more importantly, you need to show that there is a, a connection, a nexus between the documents that you seek and the issues in dispute between the parties. And um, in this case, what the plaintiffs argued was, if you look at section 91.4 of the Admin and Probate Act, one of the factors is a court will consider any uh, inter vivos transfers or benefits received by beneficiaries during their lifetime. And so what the girls were arguing was, look, the, sons and, uh, the son and the grandsons have received these benefits during dad's lifetime. Um, that's a relevant factor for the court to take into account. Therefore, the documents are required to investigate that factor further. And they relied very heavily on section 91, subsection 4, for their argument in support of discovery. Um, the, the defendants argued, by contrast, that in fact section 91, subsection 4 was irrelevant. It had nothing to do with uh, whether a court should exercise discretion to award discovery. What was relevant for a court to consider was uh, whether the issues in dispute as they were presently framed, and I emphasise that, as they were presently framed, did the issues in dispute warrant a discovery order being made? And this comes back to thinking very carefully about how you're going to draft your affidavits. Don't just go through the motions and tick the boxes. Think strategically about what it is that your clients want to achieve and how they're going to go about doing it. In this case, it was held that the, um, the uh, affidavit materials were instructive. Um, uh, the judge held that um, it was that material that was relevant. Uh, he, he agreed, uh, I forget who the judge was, just, Justice Digby. He agreed with the defendants that um, section 91.4 was not relevant, that what he needed to consider was the affidavit material before him. And he found that the affidavits by the plaintiff daughters simply alluded to all of these transfers taking place, all of the inter vivos gifts and, and um, benefits conferred on the son and grandson. Um, it, was, it was more of a whinge. <laughs> you know, they got it all when he was alive and we've got nothing now, fix it. And that was just simply not enough. Uh, I will quote um, uh, defend, the, the defendant's counsel for the estate made this point. Um, she said there was no evidence of a financial need or, a fi of a fi or of a financial competing claim and it was said that the plaintiffs were instead, quote, competing with the deceased's freedom of testation rather than with the other beneficiaries. That's really important. She was basically saying they're just having a whinge, there's no competing need here, there's no evidence of a competing need. What the plaintiffs are seeking to do are to compete with the testator's freedom of testation. And, and that was a really important distinction. I thought it was very cleverly stated as well, because it really gets down to the point of what is it that they're complaining about here? If they want to squarely raise the issue of what the, the son and the grandsons received during dad's lifetime, raise it. Raise it as a positive case and run it as a positive, positive case. Grill your clients about what um, they knew about what transfers were being done and, and what properties were being um, given to the grandsons and the son. I mean, if you, one of the, the, the executors was the brother of these sisters. Uh, they would have known, they must have known that he's getting properties here and there and suddenly he's got all this money, he's cashed up. Um, there would have been um, some evidence that could have been elicited by the daughters to, to run a positive claim in that regard. Um, and unfortunately, um, there wasn't enough evidence to support that claim. Um, His Honour held that it was the plaintiff's affidavit material which should be considered as instructive in determining what was in issue. Hence, it was not persuaded, uh, he was not persuaded that the plaintiff's substantive case had put in issue um, those matters. There was no evidence to support what they were, what they were wanting to, to achieve there. They had failed to establish any special circumstance that would justify an order for discovery. Um, a final point, but certainly no less important, was the timing at which this application was made. It was made quite late in the piece 
and um, the extent of the discovery was just enormous. Uh, I think uh, His Honour agreed with the defendant's submissions that the discovery, if it was ordered at this late stage, would uh, stretch out the interlocutory phase of the proceeding um, by about six months and would result in a three-day estimated trial being extended to ten days. Uh, and His Honour just did not accept that um, in the circumstances of this case that such an order was uh, justifiable given the consequences of the delay and the cost that would be involved, the incredible cost that would be involved um, to, to order the discovery. So I've, I've put down some strategy points in page eight um, of my paper, just again emphasising, thinking about how you're going to draft your affidavit material, think about the strategic steps that you want to take um, and, and really setting up a good advantage for your client and getting, again, not just a good result, but a great result. Um, and again, thinking about Will's cases um, on a commercial level, Tributi, which was the case that Tony was involved in, freezing orders, that was quite an interesting case as well. Um, the, the plaintiffs in that case were seeking a one-third interest in the deceased super fund that had been left in the custody and control of the widow, mum. It was worth approximately $3 million, this super fund. Um, it became necessary to amend the statement of claim to allege that the uh, plaintiffs had an equitable interest in, uh, one-third interest in the fund. Um, consent was sought, that was refused, so the necessary application for leave to amend was made. Uh, leave was granted and uh, the defendant, in fact, had been put on notice that the plaintiffs were going to be claiming a one-third interest in the super fund. That's important. Um, she refused to uh, consent to the amendment. They got leave. Uh, soon after leave was given, uh, the, re relevant, uh, the requisite undertakings were sought from mum that she would preserve the, the um, super fund until the determination of the hearing. And um, at that point, when she was asked for the undertaking, uh, she, her solicitors wrote to the plaintiffs and said, well, there's no super fund, I've wound it up. This was wound up three days, three days before the application for leave to amend the statement of claim was made. So they're going off to court to amend the statement of claim. She knew what the plaintiff's claim was to allege a one-third interest in the super fund. And three days earlier, she had wound it all up already. In fact, she'd used $250,000 of it to buy a property for her granddaughter or grandson. Um, and so she said, look, sorry, it's not, no longer there. Um, so, you know, to the plaintiff's shock and horror, they then sought undertakings that um, there would be uh, no further dissipation of the, uh, of the fund and for reasons known only to the defendant, she again was unable to provide those undertakings. So off we go to get an ex parte freezing order, a uh, very urgent <laughs> ex parte freezing order. And um, this was opposed on the basis that the uh, defendant argued that there was no danger. There was no evidence that there was any danger that the funds were going to be dissipated. And in fact, uh, she was also alleging that she had um, uh, special needs and financial needs by reason of the fact that she had bought, she had used $250,000 to buy the house for the granddaughter. She was now at risk of being in financial need. I don't know how quite that works, but anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, she opposed it on those grounds. Now, there was an interesting debate about whether the plaintiffs were... Uh, in order to obtain their freezing order, did they need to show that there was an arguable cause of action? And uh, the plaintiffs argued that they didn't need to show there was an arguable cause of action. Justice uh, Hargrave didn't agree. And if you look at uh, Order 37, Capital A, which deals with freezing orders, um, order th Rule 37, Capital A, 0.05, subsection 1, paragraph B, states expressly, <laughs> a bit of a mouthful, states expressly that um, a precondition to obtaining a freezing order is that the plaintiff um, uh, shows that there is an arguable case before the order will be made. 
Um, so again, uh, think about the material that you're going to rely on, think about your affidavits and how you draft them. Um, uh, now in that case, even though technically speaking, because there was no evidence that there was an arguable case, the uh, application ought to have been dismissed, but it was agreed that it would proceed. Um, there was no technical argument to be taken by the defendant, so they were happy for it to, to go on. And um, the plaintiffs also conceded that they were actually only, um, they really only had a maximum interest in the, in the fund to the amount of 1.8 million, and that was the amount that the freezing order was made for. So it was a very good result in the end, um, despite the technical uh, arguments about whether there was a cause of action disclosed or not. Um, so uh, again, freezing orders, um, they're not there to secure the interest of the plaintiff um, to the asset claimed in the estate, um, and nor does it finally decide the rights of the parties. So don't think that because you've got a freezing order, it's game over. <laughs> um, there's still a, a trial to be had. It's not to be used as a weapon against insolvency or to circumvent creditors of the estate or, or to um, get around an insolvent estate. So, so bear that in mind. Um, yep. And um, a freezing order will only be made where um, you can show a good, a good arguable case. So again, bear, in, bear, it, bear it in mind as um, a tool that you can use in your uh, wills practice. I've been told I've got five more minutes, so I'm not going to discuss the next case, but I will jump to Rhys Steiner, because that was a very interesting case concerning costs. The, uh, the executrix has sought uh, costs of a family court proceeding, which uh, they commenced. So it was a, a really good decision, uh, Justice McMillan heard, uh, whether an estate could uh, seek costs of, a, of, a, of a, another related proceeding in another jurisdiction. Um, very briefly, the facts were that um, the, uh, one of the executrix was a cousin of the deceased and uh, she sought parenting orders in relation to the infant child of the, of the deceased, four-year-old Emma. Um, four-year-old Emma was uh, a beneficiary of the residuary estate to the tune of 1.4 million. Um, there was a statement of wishes attached to the will and the deceased had um, stated that she wanted uh, Emma to be able to visit her family in Australia if she couldn't stay in Australia. Ultimately, she wanted her child to stay in Australia. If she couldn't, a will trust was set up for her to be able to afford to come back whenever she wanted and also to obtain a Jewish education here in Australia. Emma's father was a Dutch and New Zealand citizen and he had separated from the deceased. Um, and he took Emma out of the country um, and this prompted the, um, ex the executor cousin to make uh, a, to issue family court proceedings to get Emma back, and to also ask for parenting orders that would enable the deceased's parents to have access to Emma as well. Um, now it turns out that the costs and disbursements of the family court proceeding at that point amounted to, amounted to forty-seven thousand. And there were further estimated costs of between 20 and 80,000. The relevant clause in the will was clause 9B, and that um, it's a it's a it's not a uh, we use these clauses quite a bit in wills. Um, 9B was uh, to advance and imply, apply the whole or part of the income or capital of any share of my estate to which a beneficiary has a vested contingent or presumptive interest for his or her maintenance, education, advancement, or benefit. And those are the words that Justice McMillan considered in this case, was the uh, commencement of the family court proceedings and the costs incurred in that proceeding, was that for the benefit, advancement and um, education of Emma. And uh, ultimately it was held that it wasn't because at the end of the day, Dad held custody of Emma. Dad had the ultimate say in what would happen to Emma. So the commencement of those family court proceedings would not guarantee um, that the costs would be the costs incurred would be for Emma's benefit in the, at the end of the day. Um, so Justice McMillan, um, I must say, reluctantly um, did not agree to award the executor cousin the costs of that family court proceeding. It's in she does Justice McMillan does talk about McIverley and Barnsley, which was a a um, um, 
a, a, a case that was similar to this one. The difference with that case, the, the plaintiff was a beneficiary and he also sought, um, he was an adult, he also sought costs from the court in respect of a, a leave to apply for, um, a leave to the High Court to appeal a, a criminal conviction. Um, and there was a paternity suit as well that he needed to instigate to determine whether a child was really his. And so he sought from the trustees funds from the estate that was held for his benefit to um, uh, uh, pay for those costs. And um, he was awarded the costs, I'll finish up now, he was awarded the costs of the um, High Court leave application but not the paternity suit. And what Macmillan said there, the McKivillary could be distinguished because the adult beneficiary there was an adult, he could represent his own interests and um, it wasn't the case here because Emma was an infant and there was no contradictor to advance her interests so costs needed to be thought of very carefully um, and she didn't, she didn't make the order. So anyway, um, that's my paper, happy to take any questions. Not, not yet. Oh, not yet? Okay, no, not yet. We're, we're having questions I'm, I'm, at the I'm mucking around with the, pro with the no, right. process. We're having so. questions at the end of the second part okay, good. Eleanor's paper. Good. All right, thank you. Good. Um, I, I was getting a bit concerned there because uh, I'm aware that Terry's running in the Great Ocean Road Marathon next month and I was wondering whether she might be using this paper as a, uh, a precursor to, to that event. But thankfully she hasn't. It was an excellent paper, I think. Just in re relation to that Tribuzzi matter that I was in... Uh, no truer word was said than the, when Terry mentioned it's not, it's not the end of the proceeding, it's just the start. Um, uh, that the, the freezing order in relation to the super fund was only a side issue in the case. It's set down for a two-week trial in February and it concerns the primary a asset is a, a, a 20 or $30 million quarry down near Cranbourne. The super fund was, uh, was something we came across during, during discovery. So uh, that was what launched just before Kavanagh Jay on the ex parte application, then before Kim Hargrave on the contested application for the super. So that's safely now quarantined and that will be uh, heard along with the, uh, with the trust case, the constructive trust case in, um, in February. Uh, I'd like you to thank Terry for an excellent paper and, the, and an excellent presentation, if you would please do so. Thank you.